I thought I might start with the sandwich, <laughs> Mr. Treasurer. So Stephen Kennedy is the head of Treasury, comes up to your house in Logan in Brisbane. <clears throat> and what does he say? Does he say, sorry about this, Treasurer? Does he say... 4.25%, you know, we didn't really mean it. Uh, does he say we've got an interest rate, inflation, energy explosion? What, how were you briefed on how bad things were? Well, I was really grateful to Stephen. He'd be the first Treasury Secretary in the history of humankind to come out to Logan City, so he already gets a big tick mm -hmm. uh, from me. I appreciate that uh, a lot. He came to my house on the Sunday around lunchtime. Uh, and we had a good frank conversation about the circumstances that we inherited. Uh, and clearly, there was enough of a sense immediately prior to the election with the interest rate rise, the inflation number coming in at 5.1%, the highest in, in more than two decades. And so we had a sense of the challenges. But I think um, that inflation problem has gotten worse in the subsequent period, even in the last few weeks, if you listen to the Reserve Bank Governor, as we all do. Uh, energy prices have been a big part of the story, grocery prices and elsewhere in the economy. So that's the big... The main part of the conversation that I've been having with Treasury is around the inflation outlook, what that means for interest rates and what that then means for economic activity. Uh, but the budget is of concern to us as well. You know, that's one of the reasons why Katie Gallagher and I nominated $11.5 billion worth of savings even before the election, and we're looking for more now because we desperately need to improve the quality of the budget. Uh, and as I said, I think uh, one of your colleagues, Trudy McIntosh, asked me a question at a press conference soon after uh, I was sworn in. And when it comes to the budget, we need to recognise that there won't just be these kind of automatic upgrades to the budget. Mm -hmm. Commodity prices are helping, but some of the other upgrades uh, are not necessarily eventuating. And we've got a lot of pressures uh, which weren't in the budget that we inherited. They weren't you know, factored in things like some of the ongoing costs of COVID-19. So all of that together is a pretty challenging outlook, as I ran through from the lectern a moment ago, and I've been in more or less uh, rolling daily conversations with the Treasury about them. All right, you said uh, uh, kind of the big element of discussion in that speech when you spoke about inflation's going to go a lot higher than 5.1%. So are we talking 8? Are we talking 10? And then... It, uh, does the Reserve Bank have the equipment to make sure next year's four, for example? Well, I'll upgrade the... I'll update the inflation forecast uh, in a methodical way rather than, uh, you know, have a stab, at, have a stab at it over, <laughs> over lunch today, as much as I respect you all. Uh, but if you listen to the Reserve Bank Governor even yesterday, you know, their expectations were around 6% uh, and the indications he gave yesterday that he was that he thought it would be worse than that. And, you know, Ross and others here uh, who do their own analysis, I think it's almost universally um, agreed now uh, that inflation will be certainly north of the 5.1 we saw in the March quarter and, and most likely north of the of the 6% that people have been talking about. But I'll, I'll update that forecast properly at the end of July. And for how long, just to tend to... A little bit more. Uh, this challenge will be with us for a while, uh, and it, it has different characteristics. You know, we talk about energy, we talk about groceries, shipping costs have been a big part of the story, as Jennifer and I have discussed uh, on earlier occasions. And so the the character of the challenge has has changed, even kind of week to week. Mm. Uh, but I think most of us would expect that we'll have inflation with us uh, certainly for the rest of this year, at least. So I might ask Jennifer, what does this mean for business? This high inflationary environment. It seems a worldwide phenomenon. Does business get through it? What approach do you need from the government and the Reserve Bank? Is budget repair important? Budget repair is important because um, we've got to remember that having a strong budget allowed us to respond to COVID. I mean, if we had a, a very weak budget, we would have not had that capacity to respond. But we've got to do that in a way that's about growth. Uh, I don't think you can cut your way out of this. I think you've got to grow your way out of this. Every time we add a percentage point to the GDP, we add nearly $5 billion to the coffers of government. I think what business needs now is, first of all, we need to recognise we're in a pretty good spot as a country. You've got good starting position. You've got very, very um, good business environment. You've got all the things that the world wants. So you wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here. But I think what we need to do now is not 
kick the can down the road anymore on these big productivity changes that we need to make. We've got to do some short-term things, which is about labour supply and reducing the friction in supply chains. But we've really got to get our act together now on those productivity-enhancing things that will drive wages growth, which we want to see. You know, our skill system, driving uh, investment harder, which is still very, very low as a percentage of GDP, uh, getting our industrial relations system to be more cooperative, getting the EBA system back on track, which means people get paid more, getting energy policy sorted in the country once and for all, manage the transition properly rather than argue about whether you need to have it or not, uh, and then obviously make sure we bring the community with us, which is really part of the economic summit the Prime Minister wants to do. And we, we, we show that we can do this. We've brought the community with us, I think, in COVID pretty well. We, we can bring the community with us. But I, I think... Surely, you know, the time for kicking this down the road any further on those big productivity changes we need to make. I, I think, I don't know how many more near misses this country needs to have before it doesn't miss one. Jennifer, if you had one thing that Jim needs to sort out here, what would it be? And also today in The Australian, you wrote about the skill shortage and the labour shortage. Yep. 400,000 jobs not filled in this country. We need to talk about migration, don't we? Well, we need to do some short and long-term things. We've got to talk about the skill shortages because it's actually going to be a handbrake to recovery. Because, you know, whether you're a small business or a restaurant, you're not opening five days a week, you're opening three. Uh, you know, everyone is so constrained by this. And people... People kind of, I think, artificially think this will somehow in and of itself inflate wages. It will inflate them in certain pockets, but it will actually stop more being done. Big pro companies tell me, I'm not even tendering for this job anymore, Jennifer, because I can't staff it up. So that's something they'll do somewhere else. So we've got to, we've got to fix that problem. We've got to find ways of incentivising people to come here. Uh, we've got to make the skill system more attractive. We've got to move from two-year visas to four-year visas. And then, of course, we would like to see a temporary increase in um, migration to around 222,000 um, with a 70% waiting on skills. And then finally, we've got to make it easier to bring people in. There is so much red tape. Uh, in getting people into the country. So much friction in the migration system. We need to clear the way uh, and, and make sure that we are, you know, doing that as easily as possible. Behind that, as the Treasurer's talked about, as the Prime Minister's talked about, we've got to skill Australians, which I talked about in the Australian Today. And we've got to do that faster, better, smarter, and, you know, get out of this kind of Dickensian education model that we're trapped in. All right.